الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم In our previous session we began to look at the circumstances of people on the day of judgment in verses 46 and 47 uh, we looked at the statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regards and this is following the, the parables concerning people of this life and people of the next uh, people whose wealth has caused them to lose track of the purpose of this life and who have forgotten Allah or deny Allah's existence Allah then goes on to point out that the wealth this was in 46 that they have gathered is of no real value it might benefit them to some degree in this life and even that benefit is limited not continual but that what really benefits from this life in the next is righteous deeds and in 47, Allah began to describe the events of the Day of Judgment, and this is only some of them, there are many others described throughout the Qur'an. Those events concerning the shifting of the mountains, Allah began with that, we said that this is the most outstanding feature on the earth, its great mountains that we consider to be so solid and so firm, that Allah begins by describing them as being uh, as shifting, as moving, as becoming soft in their appearance, like fluffed wool, then eventually disappearing, and the earth becoming flat and level plain. And at that point, people would be gathered, the resurrection would take place, and people would be gathered in, uh, in the plain, on the earth which has been leveled, sometimes described as like a flat loaf of bread, that is our bread. And Allah rebukes those who claimed that they wouldn't be returned, that they would not have to come back to face judgment. He rebuked them, saying, describing first that they've come back as they were created. Oh, no, that we didn't get that yet, right. Okay, just, we went up as far as the fact that they would be gathered together and none would escape the gathering. Uh, before going into 48, where Allah continues to describe how people are gathered, uh, somebody had asked about the hadith I mentioned concerning the hornless rams and the horned rams, that they would be brought back and the horned ram which defeated or knocked the hornless ram off the mountain would get knocked off the mountain by the hornless ram. Uh, the, I mentioned it was a hadith, it's found in Sahih Muslim for those who wanted to follow up that particular hadith in volume 4 is of the English uh, hadith number 6252. Uh, the hadith, the statement of the hadith, uh, one of the narrations from Abu Huraira is that you will return rights to their owners. You all will return rights to their owners on the day of resurrection until retaliation will be given to the hornless ram from the horned ram. Going on to verse 48. وَعُرِضُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ صَفَّا لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَ كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً بَلْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنْ لَنْ نَجْعَلَ لَكُمْ مَوْعِدًا And they will be presented before your Lord in rows. And He will say, Indeed you have come to me in the same way that I first created you. But you claimed that I had not set a time for us to meet. So after describing the gathering and the flattening of the earth, 
Allah begins to describe how human beings will be presented to Him. وَعُرِضُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ صَفَّا And they will be presented before your Lord in rows. Which means that they will be lined up before Allah for judgment. However, though that presentation of for judgment will be an open presentation before all of creation, uh, this is only in the case of the disbelievers. For the true believers, Allah will take them aside. And He will be alone with them, identifying their sins. And they will admit their sins to such a degree that the individual believer having seen all of his sins or her sins, will feel that for sure they will be destroyed, that they have lost. They weren't aware of so many things, all of it recorded. And at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them, سَتَرْتُهَا عَلَيْكَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَأَنَا أَغْفِرُهَا لَكَ الْيَوْمِ I have hidden them for you in the world, and today I forgive you for them. I have hidden them for you in the world. In this world, these sins were hidden from people. They're sins which are known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for the believer, in the next life, Allah will forgive them of those sins. They will not be exposed to the creatures of the earth, as will be the case for the non-believers. Now, following that, the criminals, the evil ones, those who denied the messengers and rebelled against their Lord, and were haughty, will be brought forth in chains, as they are brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ يَوْمَئِذٍ مُقَرَّنِينَ فِي الْأَصْفَادِ صَرَابِيلُهُمْ مِنْ قَطِرَانِ وَتَغْشَى وُجُوهُهُمُ النَّارِ And you will see the criminals on that day bound in chains, their garments of pitch and their face, faces covered by fire. And the Almighty explained elsewhere concerning the presentation of the creatures before their Lord and what will be said to them is in Surah Hud, verses 18 and 19. And who does more wrong than he who invents a lie against Allah? Such will be brought before their Lord and witnesses will say, these are the ones who lied against their Lord. No doubt, the curse of Allah is on the wrongdoers who hinder others from the path of Allah and seek in it crookedness while disbelieving in the hereafter. And due to the severity of the terror of that day, the nations and the people of the nations will fall to their knees when they are called forth to give account. Like a person on death row, when he is called, his time has come, his knees buckle, he falls down on his knees. You find in Surah Al-Jathiyah verse uh, 28, Allah is saying there, and you will see each nation humbled to their knees. Each nation will be called to its record. This day you will be rewarded for what you used to do. Allah goes on to say, لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَا كَمَا خَلَقُنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً Indeed, you have come to me in the same way that I first created you. So Allah will rebuke those who deny the hereafter and reprimand them before all of creation, saying, Indeed, you have come to me in the same way that I first created you. After all that pomp and the glory, all the greatness that you thought you had, you are brought back before Allah as you were first created, without wealth, clothes, or anything. And in the Arabic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses لَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَ You have come to me using a past tense though he's speaking about the future. And this is used in many places in the Quran in order to emphasize the certainty of what is going to take place. So he speaks about the future 
using the past. People, as we said, will return to him as he first created them. Even body parts, which are lost in this life, for one reason or another, whether it's circumcision or whatever, uh, this will all come back. We come back to before Allah uncircumcised. As the Prophet ﷺ said, mankind will be gathered barefooted, naked and uncircumcised. تُحْشَرُونَ حُفَاتًا وَرَعْتًا غُرْلًا when Aisha heard the Prophet ﷺ say, say, say that, she asked, O Messenger of Allah, will men and women stare at each other? You know, because of course in this life, this haram, you know, people are clothed. So isn't that going to create a situation? The Prophet ﷺ said, O Aisha, the situation would be too scary for that to be of any importance to them. Al-amru ashad min and and what? Yuhimmuhum dak. Al-amru ashad min ayyuhimmuhum dak. The situation will be too scary for that to be of any importance to them. So people will be brought back completely naked. And the first person who will be clothed, Prophet ﷺ has given us information, detailed information about that day. The first person who will be clothed. Of course everybody here is ready to say Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. But it's not. Prophet Muhammad delivered a sermon and he said, O oh people, Allah will assemble you barefooted, naked and non-circumcised. And he quoted the verse from the Quran, As I created you the first time, I will repeat it. I promise binding on myself. And the first person will be clothed on the day of resurrection will be Prophet Ibrahim. Prophet Ibrahim will be the first to be clothed. The well, scholars differed as to why Prophet Abraham would be the first to be clothed. Some suggested that it was because he feared Allah more than anyone. So his clothing was hastened to put his heart at rest. It is possible as it is narrated that he was the first to wear pants under his clothing while praying in order to exaggerate the covering of his private parts and to ensure that his privates would not touch his places of prayer. So he was rewarded by being the first covered on the day of resurrection. It is also possible that those who threw him in the fire stripped him of his clothing in front of people as was done to those to be killed. So he was rewarded with being the first to be clothed on the day of resurrection before all the witnesses. And this according to uh, some of the scholars anyway uh, is the best explanation. And there are some authentic texts which indicate that people will be resurrected with clothing on. So though we have these clear texts indicating that they will be naked and Abraham will be the first to be covered, we have a text from the Prophet ﷺ narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri when he was on his deathbed because he called for new clothes to be put on and he told the people around him that he heard the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الْمَيِّتِ يُبْعَثُ فِي ثِيَابِ أَلَّتِي يَمُوتُ فِيهَا Indeed, the dead will be resurrected in the clothes in which they die. Imam al-Bayhaqi, he resolved the apparent conflict between these uh, from three perspectives. One, that the clothes will disintegrate after they stand up from their graves. So they will be naked at the place of assembly, then they will be clothed in the clothes of paradise. So at the time of initial resurrection, they're coming up with clothes on, but then this will disintegrate. The second explanation was that when the prophets, the truthful, righteous, then those after them, according to their ranks, are clothed, each person will wear clothes like those in which he died. And in the clothing that they do, they are resurrected naked, as the Prophet ﷺ said, as it appears from Allah's statements, that then they, when they're clothed, the clothing that they will be getting will be the clothing that they were buried in. Then they will enter paradise and they will wear the clothes of paradise. The third explanation, that the meaning of clothes here refers to their deeds. The meaning of clothes here refers to their deeds. That is, they will be resurrected in good or evil deeds that they were doing when they died. 
Almighty Allah had said, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ And the clothing of piety is better. That's in Surah Al-A'raf verse 26. And Jabir, he had narrated from the Prophet ﷺ that he said, يُبْعَثُ كُلُّ عَبْدٍ عَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ Every slave will be resurrected doing whatever deeds he died doing. And Ibn Abbas, he said a man was standing at Arafah. He fell from his horse and it trampled him. The Prophet ﷺ said, bathe him with water and lotus leaves, shroud him in, two, in his two garments, and do not put perfume on him nor cover his head, for he will be resurrected on the day of resurrection, reciting the Talbiyah. So he's bringing this as evidence that the intent of clothing here was in reference to deeds as opposed to the actual physical clothing, that this was the possible understanding. He went on to say, al Bayhaqi went on to say, it should not be understood that the slave will be resurrected in the clothing in which he was shrouded in, or in which he died. He is resurrected in the state of his faith or, or disbelief, his certainty or doubt, in which he died, and doing the deeds he was doing at the time of his death. This is indicated by the following narration from Abdullah ibn Amr, in which he related that Allah's Messenger said, if Allah wishes to punish a people, Whoever is among them will also be afflicted by the punishment. Then he will resurrect, then they will be resurrected according to their deeds. If Allah wishes to punish a people, whoever is among them will also be afflicted by the punishment. Meaning, if there are righteous people amongst them, they will also be subject to that punishment. However, they will be resurrected according to their deeds. And uh, Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, he related that the Prophet ﷺ had also said, on the day of resurrection, the sun will come so close to people, that it will be like the distance of a mile. <coughs> they will be submerged in sweat according to their deeds, some up to their knees, some up to their waists, and some will have a bridle of sweat. And while saying this, he pointed his hand towards his mouth. Allah goes on to say, بَلْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنْ لَنْ نَجْعَلَ لَكُمْ مَوْعِدًا Then the disbelievers will be further humiliated by being told, but you claim that I had not set a time for us to meet. That is, you denied that deeds would be judged. And Allah promised and warned that they would. Now you have seen it and know that your claim was false. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 49 goes on to describe the receipt of the books for the judgment. He said, وَوُدْعَ الْكِتَابُ فَتَرَ الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِيهِ وَيَقُولُونَ يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرًا إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا When the book will be placed in their hands, and you will see the criminals fearful of what is in it, they will say, Woe to us! What kind of book is this, in which everything small and big is counted? They will find all that they did presented before them, and your Lord is not unjust to anyone. In this verse, Allah continues to describe the, some of the events of the Day of Judgment after people have been resurrected and lined up in rows before Him for judgment. And we note that really in the Qur'an, Allah describes elements of the Day of Judgment in different places. And He repeats them in different ways. Uh, each time that they are mentioned, different aspects are referred to to give us an overall picture, rather than giving it to us like one chapter of the Qur'an called, for example, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You know, that's how we get books. We find all of the information there in that one chapter, done, finish. Right? But in order for us to be constantly reminded about it, that it should be connected to everything that we do, everything that we are obliged to do in Islam is connected 
win the day of judgment. So Allah, while talking about all of the other subjects of the Quran, continually brings us back to the issue of the day of resurrection. And also, some might find it strange, actually non-Muslims, sometimes reading the Quran, when they see the way that the topics shift. We were talking about the people uh, and the garden, then we shifted over to the resurrection, then after this, we were shifting over to Allah telling the angels to bow, and after that, you know, going into another topic and another topic, we find the Quran shifting from topic to topic. Uh, sometimes non-Muslims in analyzing the Quran have claimed that it's confusing. You know, it doesn't follow the pattern of a book. They're used to reading a book where you begin, characters are introduced, storyline is developed, climax, then, you know, tapering off to your conclusions, etc. That's the norm. And we can find that, for example, in Surah Yusuf. Basically, that surah does follow that pattern. But it's only a surah. And still, even though it follows that pattern in general, there are things popping in at different points in the story. So, how do we explain to them, why is it like this? I mean, for them, it's just that Muhammad Wasallam was confused. You know, he didn't know what to write about, so he just wrote about everything that came to his head. Well, actually, the point is that the Qur'an is a Qur'an. A Qur'an which is a recitation. Something which has been recited to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to us, addressing us. And if we observe how people speak, do we speak like books that we write? Do you find a person sitting down and telling you a whole story? I mean, unless you're telling a kid a story. But the norm, when we sit down to talk, we don't talk like books. We start talking about something, then we may shift to something else, and we shift to something else, and you know, we move around. And, and if we have a general idea we're trying to get across, we might repeat it, you know, in different points as we're telling, talking to people. So what is happening is that the Qur'an is Allah talking to us directly. So He talks to us the way we talk. Our ideas are shifting, but there is a main theme. Because when we sit down to talk to people, most often, we have something basic, something cent central that we want to try to get across. And in order to get that basic and that central idea across, we express whatever we're talking about, even though we might shift the topic, we express it within those topics. And if we understand what is the main theme of the Qur'an, then everything gets linked together. The main theme of the Qur'an, or we could say the focus of the Qur'an, is on human beings. It's all about humankind. Humankind in their relationship to Allah, in their relationship to other human beings around them, and in the world in which they live. So whatever Allah speaks about, somewhere or another it is related back to us as human beings. Some guidance, some information is being given to us in how we should relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to our Creator. How we should communicate and deal with other human beings around us in this world. And the world in which we live, what we should take from this world, from the history that we have collected, from the signs that Allah has left in the creation, all of this is geared towards developing the individual. So the theme is really guidance for human beings. If we keep that in mind, then all of the switching and changing of topics all come together. Because no matter where the topics go, that essential message is there. So Allah continues. It's only a couple of verses that He deals with the issue of resurrection here. Then He switches. الكتاب, then the book will be placed in their hands. Meaning that the books of deeds will be distributed among people. Some receiving it in their right hands and others in their left hands. 
But Allah said, the book. How did we go from the book to books? Well, the term book here, the book, Al-Kitab, is looked at as really a class. The class of books which, we, which records the deeds. So it's not talking about an individual book, but the category of all these books come together in one category, the category of the recorded deeds. Right? So Allah refers to it as the book. And He says, for example, in Surah Al-Inshiqaq, verses 7 to 12, Then as for him who will be given his record in his right hand, he, will, he, will surely, he surely will receive an easy reckoning, and he will return to his family in joy. But whoever is given his record behind his back, he will invoke for his destruction, and he will enter a blazing fire, and made to taste its burning. And in Surah al haqqa Allah says there, but as for him who will be given his record in his left hand, he will say, I wish that I had not been given my record, and that I had not ever known how my account was. So the books will be distributed. Some in the right hands, and some in the left hands. And those people who are attacking the Qur'an for contradictions, as contradictions, thousands of contradictions have been shown in the Bible, in order to try to respond to this, you know, missionaries have made an effort to find contradictions in the Qur'an. Because Allah challenges people to find contradictions in the Qur'an. Right? So they say, here is a contradiction. In one place it says, they will receive the book of deeds in the left hand, the bad people, the criminals. In another place it says, they will receive it behind the backs. Do they receive it in the left hand, or do they, do they receive it behind their backs? See, they've tried to find a contradiction here. But what is the solution for that? Very simple. What is the solution? Is there a contradiction here? They're, re they're receiving it in their left hand behind their backs. <laughs> Very simple solution, it's not complicated. That the receipt will be in their left hand, but behind their backs. They will try to hide from it, they don't want to receive it. So it's not going in their right hand, it has to go in their left hand. So they try to put their hand there so it won't come to them, but no, it's getting coming to them anyway in the left hand, but behind their backs. And in Surah Al-Isra, Allah says there, وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِهِ وَنُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كِتَابًا يَلْقَاهُ مَنْ شُرًا I have fastened every person's deeds to his neck. On the day of resurrection, I will bring out a book for him, which he will find wide open. He will be told, read your book. You are sufficient as a reckoner against yourself today. So each person will see his or her deeds. And they will be able to judge themselves. This is the completeness, this is the expression of the completeness of Allah's justice. We will all know where we are headed. We will know that we put ourselves wherever we have ended. We will know that if we are going towards paradise, it is by the grace of Allah, in spite of what we have done. And if though we are going to hell, we will know that we are going to hell because of what we have chosen in spite of the options we had not to go there. So Allah goes on to say, وَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِيهِ And you will see the criminals fearful of what is in it. Means that the people will see the disbelievers afraid about the exposure of the evil records in their books because they know what they have done. For the evil person, for the believers, uh, they may not know, thinking that they have tried to do the best they could, the evil which is in their books, it comes as a surprise to them. For the disbeliever, it's no surprise. Because they know what they did, even before the books are brought. And they will say, as Allah goes on to say, وَيَقُولُونَ يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرًا إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا and they will say, woe to us, what kind of book is this in which everything small and big is counted? Nothing 
escapes the count. And small and big here refer to major and minor sins. Small sins, minor sins, and the big referring to the major sins. Of course, scholars in terms of defining what is a major sin, they are different. You'll find different opinions uh, relative to different scholars. Prophet ﷺ has made reference to سبع seven destructive sins. But that in itself does not represent the totality of what we would call the major sins. In fact, some scholars have written books on Al-Kaba'ir, and a whole text on it. Anyway, what we can note here is that Allah mentions here, these people are, quotes these people are saying, that everything small and big is counted. Normally we'd say big and small. The big and even the small. But they start with the small, then go on to the big. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said in Surah An-Nisa, إِن تَجْتَنِبُوا كَبَائِرَ مَا تُنْحَوْنَ عَنْهُ نُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ وَنُدْخِلْكُمْ مُدْخَلًا كَرِيمًا If you avoid the major sins, which you have been forbidden to do, I will absolve you from your small sins and admit you into a noble entrance, into paradise. So, relative to the major and minor, Allah has promised that if we avoid the major sins, that He will forgive us of our minor sins. However, still the issue of why the minor mentioned before the major. Some scholars have pointed out, Imam al-Shanqiti himself pointed out, that the mention of the minor sins before the major implies that we need to take care regarding them, to take, spe- to take special care regarding the minor sins. Muhaqqarat al The sins which we considered so small, they're minor. It's only listening to music. You know, music doesn't really create major... It's only smoking a cigarette, you know. There's a bunch of little sins. Oh, it's only shaking hands of women. You know, we're only shaking their hands. We're not kissing or hugging and, you know, the things are haram, clearly haram, but this is a small one. You know, we have a variety of things. You know, it's, a, it's only a white lie, meaning a small lie. We have a variety of these things that we, 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 we disregard, we count them as small sins, minor sins. You know, nothing worth jumping up and down about, really, you know. Even, for example, wearing for men, because we always talk about hijab of women, wearing one's garments above one's ankles. You know, minor. Usually if somebody mentions this, people say, Hey, people are being killed in Kashmir, in Chechnya, you know, in Iraq, and you're talking about wearing your pants above your ankles? You know? This is such an insignificant and pointless thing to talk about. But the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا تَحْتَ الْكَعْبَيْنِ فِي النَّارِ What is below the ankles is in the hellfire. So if it is so small, why did the Prophet ﷺ put such a big thing on it? And the reality is if we're not able to deal with the very small things, these very small things, we can't deal with them, then for sure the real big things, we won't be able to deal with it. Because the small things are easy. We said they're simple, it's minor, you know. But the reality is when you go and look at these small things, whether it's giving up music, giving up cigarettes, you know, wearing your pants below your ankles, all of these small things, when you actually come down to actually giving it up, then you find out how tough it really is. And then that tells us something about the big things. <coughs> Those big things that we are doing, we're trying to do these big things, but for sure if we look into these big things, we will find that the quality of the big things is deficient. 
it is poor. It's questionable where it is, whether it is even acceptable to Allah. Yes, we're praying five times a day. We are praying five times a day. But then we look at the each salah that we are making. How we make it. We can't even remember what surahs we read after Fatiha in it. You know, where is the consciousness when the Prophet ﷺ had said that when a person prays, only a fifth of his prayer may go up to Allah. Only a tenth may go up to Allah. Some people pray and nothing goes up to Allah. Nothing is recorded for them. So if that is the case, we go back and we look through all of the other big things. We find them consistently uh, incomplete, weak, ritualistic. We do the external, yes, we're fulfilled, yes, we did pray five times a day. But those prayers which are of no value, then what is the point of saying we prayed five times a day? You know, we fasted in Ramadan. We talked about this every Ramadan, we talk about it. But what kind of fast did we fast in Ramadan? We gained 10 kilos, you know. Taraweeh, we were half asleep. You know, we went through the motions. Yes, we did Taraweeh, we did Witter, you know, we did fast. But physically, yes. But spiritually, did we improve at the end of Ramadan? Did we feel ourselves better people than we were when we went in? Or is it we're back to where we were? The next year comes along, we're starting back as if we just started back from the same place we started last year. Same problems, same issues, same spiritual, emotional, psychological, you know, deficiencies, same. So then what was the point of that fast? And so on and so forth, through the various major acts. So that's reality. If we can't deal with the little deeds, the minor ones, then reality is that we will not be dealing properly with the big ones. That's the reality. You will not find a person doing the big ones right, complete. They are, alhamdulillah, 90%, 100% we say Kamal is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, less than 100, 90%. 90% on the major, and then in the minor things, they are 10%, 15%. It is training in the small things that gives us the strength to do the big things correctly. And that's why Prophet ﷺ had said, Beware of the scorned sins. إِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحَقَّرَاتُ الذُّنُوبِ وَمُحَقَّرَاتِ الذُّنُوبِ Beware of the scorned sins that are like a people who camp in the middle of a valley. Each of the people in the group go out to different parts of the valley and bring back twigs. With these small twigs, they're able to make a bonfire and cook their bread properly. Well cooked. So, whenever a doer of scorn sins is taken by them, Prophet ﷺ said, they destroy him. In the muhaqqarat al-dhunubi, mata yu'khadh biha sahibuha, Whenever the doer of scorn sins is taken by them, he's addicted to them. He can't let them go. They destroy him. So, Allah refers to the minor sins before the major sins as a reminder to us not to consider anything too small to do. Imam al-Shirqiti made a note here, he said that this verse indicates that disbelievers are required to follow secondary issues of the Sharia. Because they will find in their books of deeds, minor sins counted against them. If they were not required to follow the law, they would not have been recorded in their books of deeds. That normally we consider, this is an issue considering the disbelievers. Is it that they are required to accept Tawheed and then everything else follows? Or are they required not to do the other things? Whether it is abandoning alcohol, not telling lies, all of the other uh, issues of the Sharia which are secondary to the primary 
five pillars of Islam, six pillars of Iman, what comes after them, we could call them the secondary issues, that they are also required. This is implied that they are also required. Why? Because those things which we may consider secondary issues, which have to do with our social dealings, these things we know inside ourselves to be right and wrong. Allah has imprinted this in our souls. He has given us a consciousness of corruption and a consciousness of righteousness. We have that already. So all of those so-called secondary issues, these are all things which we already know. They are just outlined, recorded, made very obvious to us. But we have already accepted them in our hearts as being evil and as being good. And that's why Allah refers to the good things as the ma'roof and the evil things as the munkar. Ma'roof being those things which are known. And the munkar being those things which are universally rejected. Everybody knows inside himself or herself, it's not right. So, the disbelievers are not excused. They will be held accountable for whatever corruption they are involved in. Though the biggest issue of course is Tawheed. It doesn't absolve them, the fact that they haven't accepted that or whatever, it doesn't absolve them for the other issues. وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا They will find all that they did presented before them. Meaning that they will find the consequence of their deeds completely preserved and counted against them. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا And your Lord is not unjust to anyone. This statement, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا is an expression of the completeness of Allah's justice. He will not increase the number of evil deeds of any sinner by even one. Nor will he decrease the number of good deeds of any righteous person by one. Everybody will get exactly what is their due. He is absolutely just. And as Allah mentioned in Surah Taha, verse 112, وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَلَا يَخَافُ ظُلْمًا وَلَا هَضْمًا And whoever does righteous deeds, while he is a believer, then he will have no fear of injustice or any curtailment of his reward. <coughs> Shaykh al Uthaymin he mentioned that this verse contains what may be recall, referred to as a negated attribute of Allah. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Your Lord is not unjust to anyone. Something is negated here. Injustice is negated from Allah SWT. Most of the descriptions that Allah gives of Himself are positive and affirmative uh, attributes. Life, knowledge, ability, love, etc. But there are a few attributes which are involved negation of certain qualities from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And belief in them, as we are required to believe in the uh, beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His attributes, we are required to believe in them. We are also required to believe in the ones which are negated. In one way that the attribute which is negated we also have to negate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and while negating its opposite, negating the attribute, we have to also affirm its opposite meaning that when Allah negates injustice from himself right, he is affirming what? is affirming justice to himself. So it's not enough just to negate the injustice, but one must also affirm the justice. Because sometimes a negation does not necessarily include an affirmation. Not every negation 
statement of negation includes an affirmation. Meaning, for example, if one said, this classroom or this wall or this door is not unjust, does that affirm that the door is just? No. Because the quality of injustice is not applicable to the door or to a wall or to a room. So because it's not applicable, then its opposite is not applicable. So, with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever He has negated, its opposite is applicable. And that's why we must affirm its opposite. And Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Ahqaf, verse 33, Do they not see that Allah who created the heavens and earth, and was not wearied by their creation, is able to give life to the dead. Yes, he surely is able to do all things. He was not wearied by their creation. This is a negated attribute. Weariness is negated from Allah. Weariness which is a sign of weakness. You become weary because you are weak. So, when we negate that we have to affirm that Allah is free from any all weakness, any and all weaknesses any and all inabilities anything which would make him weak uh, less powerful etc no his power, his ability doesn't change so Allah is not unjust to any of his creatures, meaning he is perfectly just to all of his creatures. There is a philosophical point here that some people held that Allah is not unjust because injustice was not possible for him. Injustice was not possible for him. It is an attribute which could not be applied to him, period. And that's why he doesn't oppress anyone. And their argument was that since the creation belongs to Allah, Allah created it. However he deals with it, since it's his own, is correct. There's nothing that can then be considered wrong or unjust with regards to it, because it's his to do with as he pleases. This was the argument. However, this argument is false. Because Allah promised to reward the righteous and punish the sinners. If He rewarded the sinners and punished the righteous, and it's His creation, He can do anything He wishes, what would we say about that? The minimum we could say is that Allah didn't live up to His promise. Astaghfirullah. That's the minimum. If He promised that He will reward the righteous and punish the unjust, but then He did the opposite, then at least He didn't live up to His promise. And of course what comes along with it is injustice. So this line of argument is not really correct. You know, though it has a logic to it, and it sounds quite reasonable, it is not correct. The fact of the matter, if we look at the Hadith Qudsi, very famous Hadith, Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ibadi, quoting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya ibadi, inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi, wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama fala tadhalamu. O my servants, indeed I have forbidden myself from injustice, and made it forbidden among you, so do not oppress each other. O oh, my servants, indeed I have forbidden myself from injustice. Meaning, I could have been unjust, but I forbade myself from it. Because if it didn't mean that, then forbidding himself from injustice becomes meaning, meaningless. It becomes meaningless. How can you forgive, forbid yourself from something you can't do in the first place? It's meaningless. So, this you know, clarifies that in fact Allah could have, but due to the completeness of His justice, 
he has forbidden himself from that. So, Allah in telling us that he will not be unjust to anyone, also reminds us with regards to dealing with the trials and the calamities of this world. Because as we've mentioned before, time and time again, one of the biggest causes for people to become disbelievers is their inability to grasp the ultimate justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why this verse, you know, you can find this reference to Allah not oppressing anyone in a variety of other places in the Qur'an, expressed in a number of different ways. He keeps stressing this. Why? Because it is key to understanding the trials of this world. A person suffers trials, he can't understand why. That's the big question people ask. Why? Why me? Why did it have to happen to me? And because he or she can't understand this, then they come to the next thing is to say, there can't be a God. This is unfair. This is unjust. And if there is a God, God has to be just and there is no justice here. So there can't possibly be a God. This is a common road to disbelief. That's why Allah stresses that He is not unjust to anyone. So if people suffer a calamity, we have to believe that either those people deserved it, right? And Allah says in a number of places in the Qur'an that whatever befalls you is what your hands have done, what your own hands have wrought. Or those people, or some of those people, were righteous people amongst the corrupt people. So for the righteous, it is a trial. A trial to elevate their status of faith. Because this is the nature of trials in the world for the believer. That his or her faith increases with trials. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, who receives the most trials in this world? And he said, the prophets and those most like them. So if the prophets السلام, were the ones who suffered the most trials, then it means trials are actually a good thing. Though we tend to look at it as something evil. Not that we long for trials. We shouldn't. Prophet ﷺ had also told us, don't, you know, pray, ask to meet the enemy. If it comes, it comes. Don't pray for it. You know, like people get very bold, say, I want to, you know, get out there and kill me a few Jews. And you know, things like this statement, say, they feel they're, you know, ready, puffed up, ready to go fight jihad or whatever. And so they're, you know, asking Allah to bring them on, bring them on, you know. But the reality is when they come on, right, and the trial comes, will they be able to stand? Right? In fact, you end up finding them turning and running. That's reality. So the Prophet ﷺ said, don't seek hope to meet the enemy. If Allah has destined it for you, then be patient when it comes. Because that's what's going to be required. Patience. The false courage of, you know, calling for the enemy. It's easy to say. As they say, actions speak louder than words. Right? So, the point is that tragedies are for the growth of the individual. When we look at the tragedies around us, we recognize Allah does not oppress anyone, no matter how unfair it might seem. A child afflicted with disease, retardation, variety of things. You say, what did that child do to deserve this? If you try to go there, you get lost. What you have to believe is that for that child, what happened there was best. Whether it was best for the child, relative to the child itself, or relative to the parents. As in the case of Prophet Musa and Khidr. When Khidr killed the boy. That was the same thing, isn't it? What we say, we found that boy killed. Why? 
Who killed this child? Where is the justice? This is unfair. This is wrong. It's evil. But Allah removed that child to protect the parents. Uh, basically, we've come to the end of uh, this this verse, verse forty-eight. So we'll leave the next. Uh, sorry, forty-nine. We'll leave uh, verse fifty and fifty-one, which involve a shift to the next uh, session, inshallah. Uh, from this point here, we can take any questions you have on what we have covered. Remembering that uh, what is being discussed here are some of the signs of the Day of Judgment. The descriptions as reminders to us of its closeness that we should keep the resurrection, the judgment in our minds all the time. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his Prophet made belief in the resurrection, the judgment, one of the pillars of faith without which a person is not a believer. And it is essential for us in both this life and the next. It will, make a, it will determine how our next life will be. The degree to which we are able to accept the resurrection and judgment in our hearts. The degree to which we are able to make it real. To go beyond the facts and the figures and the information that we have in the Quran and the Sunnah. And reach the emotional and spiritual heights that these that this information is supposed to produce in us. Any questions? Go ahead. Brother. And you quoted another verse which said about you know a private meeting for the believers. Okay, a brother asked about verse 48. Uh, he thought that I said that this verse applies to the disbelievers. However, that's not the case. It applies to both the believers and the disbelievers. I mean, they will all be presented because everybody is brought up. But in the course of the judgment itself, their judgment, their account will not be done openly. See, the disbelievers where now they're, they're uh, but you claim that I had not set a time for us to meet who is claiming this? this is obviously the disbelievers not the believers claiming this so this element of the verse points to us that this is in reference to those who are being told you're coming back as you were first created coming back without the wealth the, the money, the power and all the things that you were so pompous about in this world you're coming back without it this is not a statement directed to the believers. But the first part, they will be presented before your Lord. This is everybody. Everybody will be brought up before. But the actual judgment, the disbelievers will be openly judged. This will be part of their humiliation on that day. You know, Allah will humiliate them. Right? Whereas the believers will be spared the humiliation. So they will be taken aside by Allah. Their deeds are dictated to them. And they will admit these deeds. And we said... You know, until the person will fear that they will be destroyed. And then Allah will say, as we hid them from you in this life, we will forgive them from you or for you in this next that life. Was the ayah. Was that a reference? Oh, that reference of the forgiveness, this is a hadith. It is found in Sahih al Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim. Right? I have hidden them for, for you in the world and today I will forgive you for them. Right? This is a hadith, statement of the Prophet Wasallam, Bukhari volume 3, hadith number 621, and Sahih Muslim volume 4, hadith number 6669. Question on the issue. I've been asked by non-Muslims about the issue of um, Imam in good works, that is the uh, means to salvation. But then they keep asking, well, why is it that we have to rely on the mercy of Allah? About this question, uh,
commonly raised if in Islam we have salvation through deeds that your works will save you uh, why then is the issue of reliance on Allah's mercy well Prophet Muhammad had said no one would enter paradise merely by his deeds or her deeds and when he was asked even you O messenger of Allah he said even I if it were not for Allah's grace not even I but the point is that the grace of Allah is connected to our deeds it is not an arbitrary grace where the evil individual gets Allah's grace and he is rewarded that we spoke about before and the righteous individual doesn't get Allah's grace and he's punished this is injustice this is unfairness in their system it works it works that's how the grace operates grace comes on you you're saved no matter what you do from the Islamic perspective the grace is that Allah multiplies the value of good deeds while holding the value of evil deeds as one for one that's where Allah's grace comes a good deed is ten times at least ten times its value so it is capable of erasing ten evil deeds equivalent of equivalent value so this is grace this is the mercy of Allah without that mercy if it was just one for one nobody would make it that's the point. Our brother is asking for uh, further elaboration concerning the verse 13 in Surah Al-Isra وَكُلُّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِ I have fastened every person's deeds to his neck meaning that they are inescapable that they are inescapable this is metaphorical language you know it is tied to your neck Allah says don't remember he talks about uh, don't put your hand out wide open in giving nor be stingy and tied to your neck so this expression of neck meaning referring to it being held close to you you know you you're not, not away from yourself close to you so in the, that same way the deeds will be stuck to us they're inescapable every person will have his deeds connected that's why Allah describes even the body parts giving witness against us the skin the hands you know and we will question why are you giving witness against Allah gave them the ability to speak it is there from Allah and this is the parts of our own body so close to us which we thought was ours yet it will be giving witness against us on the day of judgment okay if there are no further questions those of you that have emails uh, should have received an email that today inshallah is the aqiqah of my daughter Iman who was born on Saturday as well as the aqiqah for brother Ahmed Cleaver uh, whose daughter Khadija was born on Thursday so we have a double aqiqah today huh? Uh, the aqiqah for those of you that are not familiar with it uh, uh, is the rights for the newborn the child when it reaches the seventh day that it is uh, as a male circumcised as a female could be or could not uh, the hair is cut off the head it's weighed and its value in silver is given in charity it is named and an animal is slaughtered for it the aqiqa actually refers to the hair itself which is removed Prophet Muhammad did aqiqa for himself because 
it wasn't done for him as a child and uh, it is highly recommended slaughtering the animal and feeding uh, the community eating from it oneself giving thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the child and also the spilling of the blood as representative of sacrificing a part of one's wealth for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so I invite you all uh, after uh, the Salat al-Isha so no questions subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha ant astaghfiruka wa natubu alayka